Welcome to the last class of the summer. We'll begin by singing 354. song that speaks of the church's preservation by Jehovah. Like Zion's steadfast mount are they who in the Lord confide. Secure, immovable they stand forever to abide. The stanzas 1, 2, and 4, and 6. 1, 2, 4, and 6. Thank you, Teresa. Although the class tonight still has in mind the theme of the war years, we're not going to focus as much on the war years, uh, but more on how over 25 years doctrine has developed. And with that in mind, I'm going to read out of Ephesians 4. I'll start at verse 7 and read through 16. And having spoken of the unity of the church, all that we have in common, the apostle says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ." Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cutting craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ Christ. 
from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And though the PRC is not fully grown and will not be fully grown, uh, this side of heaven uh, will see in conclusion today that she did grow from an infant. She grew and matured, and also in her there is doctrinal development. Let's open. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, both for the beautiful day, the health and strength also that we manifest in coming here, and the occasion that brings us together once more to review an aspect of the history of the Church of Jesus Christ and of the Protestant Reformed Churches. Give us to see in surveying this history that though she is far from perfect, the churches of which we are a part and the denomination is a true church of Jesus Christ and one that has thy blessing not a blessing on our sins, but a using of us in spite of our weaknesses for the defense and maintenance of the truth and a working in us a love for the doctrines of sovereign grace so that with respect to those doctrines, our defense and maintenance is not just inadvertent. It doesn't just happen almost apart from our will, but in us and through us, thou dost preserve thy church and the truth. We thank thee that thy church is found over the length and breadth of the earth, and everywhere that our ascended Lord reigns and over which he rules, thy church is found. And therefore, we again have no reason for boasting. We are not the only true churches. We are not the best true churches. By thy grace, we are true churches, and we strive to be faithful. But give us to appreciate the church of Christ and the gifts of the various members wherever they are. Now may thy blessing rest on us again this evening. Cause thy name to be glorified. Remember thy people in every circumstance of life, in every burden and trial, Give them to know thy love and nearness. Forgive our sins for Jesus' sake. Amen. So last week, I treated the growth and development of the PRC in the 1940s and then ways in which the war affected the PRC. And the third part of the lecture I was going to get to last week, I didn't. And that had to do with the harbingers of a a spiritual battle of 1953. I'm going to save that for my second point this evening. And we're going to look first at what uh, what the evening's topic was going to be, looking a little more deeply into uh, the classes and the work that goes on there. Now, why focus on them? I don't think that... Uh, in future years, the Lord willing, that I keep going through some of the history. I'm not sure I'll be doing it next summer, but I do hope to continue in the future. I don't think I'll devote a a segment to what's going on in the classes every time. But this is the first decade that the PRC has a classes, for one thing. And it's in the minutes of consistories and of classes that you really see the issues that the church is facing. I have not read uh, consistory minutes in preparation for these lectures. Some would be available to me in the archives. Most are not. But at classes, you uh, can see what issues the churches are facing, what church political developments the denomination makes in its first quarter century of existence. And then, even more, you get an idea of the pulse of the churches, Not only the classes, they're also the standard bearer and the concordia give you an idea of the pulse of the churches. What are the people up to and and how are things in general? But looking at the classes also, you can get an idea of that. And I wanted to uh, dig into that a little more. 
All right, the first slide here is something that's not new to you. Our church to this day, and ever since September of 1939, has two classes. There have been at least three efforts to expand to three classes, none of which have borne fruit to this point. A classes is a group of uh, is a meeting of a group of consistories, and especially of two delegates from each consistory. There are classes East, which in the 1940s went from 11 to 13 churches in size, and classes West, which went from 10 to 11 churches. In the 1940s and until 1954, the dividing line was the Mississippi River. So that, as you've seen on handouts before, uh, when I gave you uh, which churches were in which classes and the different stats of the churches, you saw the Chicago area and Randolph as being in classes East. And in 1940, the First Synod met, to which four elders and four ministers of each classes were delegated. That number's increased now. But that's, that's beside the point, the numbers anyway, uh, giving you an idea of the structure, the, the church political structure of the congregations and denomination. Here are some random facts and tidbits. The language uh, synod in its first meeting, and both classes in their first meeting said, the official language is English, which is not new to you. But I quoted out of the minutes of classes West because they put it in a unique way. The official language of the classes shall be the language of the land. That is, of course, the English language. Both classes immediately voted for stated clerks. And until the mid-1950s, each class has had a treasurer. We don't have that now, the synodical treasurer effectually functions as the denominational treasure, including the treasure of the classes. Uh, and probably it was last week, uh, or I wonder if there's a handout I meant to put in that I didn't. At any rate, the stated clerk of classes east for the entirety of the period we're looking at, and he was also the stated clerk of synod for the entirety of the period, was Reverend and then Mr. D. Yunker. All right, uh, Classes East defeated a motion to meet three times a year. It met four times. The Church Order of Dort says that classes will ordinarily meet every quarter, four times a year, unless great distances render this inadvisable. And Classes East, being comprised of all the churches in Michigan, as well as uh, Iowa, and Randolph met, three, uh, met four times a year. Immediately the question was faced, let's just meet three times, and classes said no, and it wasn't until the 1970s, 1977, that classes East began meeting three times. Similarly, in classes West, there was a motion immediately to meet three times a year. Only there the issue was two or three. And classes said no again to that and said we're only going to meet twice a year. And the reason for that, of course, is the great distances in the 1940s, train travel, etc., coming from especially the Bellflower, Rudlands, Los Angeles area uh, to Iowa and so. And both classes, classes uh, East, met at different times, um, February and every third month was a very common meeting period. Classes West met in September and in March, and yet you keep finding in the minutes, shall we meet early September, shall we meet late September, and especially when uh, Manhattan came on board and some of the Iowa churches, the issue was harvest. It's wheat harvest time. We can't meet right in the middle of wheat harvest. One unique feature of Classes West in the 1949 was what was called the Classes Contracta. Uh, we saw that, I think, that that happened once uh, before the Synod started, so prior to 1939, and the Classes was the broadest assembly that there was a Classes Contracta, but Classes West had one of them, and its purpose was to examine candidate H.C. Hooksema. Now, what is a classes contracta? It is a meeting of any church in the classes that is able to send delegates, but the more remote churches, it's understood, might not send delegates, and the meeting will go on anyway. 
And so this is a meeting to which the churches of Iowa and Minnesota were going to send delegates with the churches of Manhattan and the three in, uh, in the uh, Southern California area were free uh, to send delegates if they wanted. This doesn't just happen, hey, let's have a little classes meeting without all the churches represented. What happened is that at the classes in September of 1949, uh, candidate Hooksma had accepted the call to Dune, but there wasn't time to prepare for his examination. So Dune said we could call a special classes. We could wait six more months for a classes. No, could we have a classes contracta? My point is a prior classes must approve of such a meeting, and then the minutes and outcome of such a meeting are approved at the following classes. In other words, uh, again, it's not just a uh, somebody's idea to do this efficiently for this once. The classes has to approve of that. You might remember that in the 1920s there was talk about hand opening for vacant churches, and hand opening meant that a church needed to ask the class's permission to call a minister. And that the churches said, let's look into this. Is this a good practice? And they decided it wasn't. Reverend Opoff was involved in researching and coming to the conclusion and helping the class to see that a church has the right to call a minister. And maybe a church can't afford to, that it's not a matter of asking permission to call a minister. It's a matter of asking uh, for subsidy. But Hand opening being now a thing of the past, you still find instances where churches had to come to the classes to say, may we call not just a minister in general, may we call this man. We still have the rule that a vacant church may not call a man more than once a year, not the same man. And there are certain men who are not eligible to be called. A man who was not more than, uh, has not yet been two years in his present charge, a missionary who hasn't uh, fulfilled the first term of service that the mission committee specified. It's longer than two years. And I believe the same is true of professors for their first seven years until they're given a permanent tenure. So you have instances of churches coming to, especially classes west, saying, may we call a man again? Um, I can't read some of... Okay, may we call one of the missionaries? 1947... Two, churches, uh, two ministers are called to be missionaries, Hoffman and Knott, and they both accept. And after a couple years, it looks like there's a, a fizzling out of work, at least it looked that way. So I believe it was Dune. Dune or Pella says, may we call one of them? The classist says, no, they're missionaries. They've been called to do that work. And then uh, another time, a church asked permission to call a man who has not, who it's called within the last 12 months. In both of these instances, Classes West says no, but conceivably good reasons could be put forward sometime for a Classes to say yes. In other words, it's not just an automatic no, but here both said no. As you study the minutes of Classes East and West, you see that there were many protests during these years. The men who were delegates to Classes were busy. And I'm not going to get into the details of the protest. It's just going to be a, um, a broader perspective uh, that there were many protests, and even some of them came up at repeated meetings. The same issue came up repeatedly. We're facing nothing new in the last five years here from that viewpoint. Uh, three of the protests regarded allegations against ministers. We've mentioned in the past about Reverend Koistra, um, but also Reverend Vanderbregen and Reverend Vermeer, and another was Reverend Opoff. In the cases of Vanderbregen and Vermeer, the classes did not just uphold the minister inside with him, although it also didn't simply uphold the Protestants. But it said, yes, there are issues. There are issues with the minister. Van der Breggen ends up getting deposed. Vermeer, I don't believe, was released. But in the minds of the congregation he served, took a call uh, 
not too quickly, uh, far, far too slowly. At any rate, with regard to Reverend Opoff, the situation was uh, a little different. And, but even there, the class has said, Reverend Opoff, there are things you've done that have contributed here, but in the main, Protestants, uh, the issue is yours and the problem is yours. That's all I'm going to say about the nature of them. The point is that they involve things that definitely concern us. It's not just a matter of my church made this or that decision, but they're a matter of men who hold office. Are they doing the work of their office faithfully? And in at least one instance, are they sinning? And are they sinning the sort of sins that deserve them to be put out of office? Two of them uh, regard a church receiving members that had left another while under discipline. So this isn't a brand new issue, even in our circles. And one, one point I'm trying to uh, thread through here is the need for consistories. When they face an issue, to suppose that probably the issue has been faced before. Now, that won't always be true. There certainly are new issues, new circumstances that come up. But much of what I read the minutes, much of what I find is stuff that our churches deal with today. And consistories ought to know this question has been faced before. Uh, in this case, a church in Classes East received members who had left another PRC and left the PRC and then returned to the PRC without going to the PRC that they left to make amends. So that's the point of bringing this up, that we uh, have, have been taught, we've, we've learned, and we've stipulated that anyone who leaves a PRC while under discipline or if not formal discipline, with still charges lodged against one, and then wants to come back, must go to the consistory that, uh, of the church that he or she left and make amends. At the end of the meetings of classes, the questions of Article 41 of the church order are asked of each uh, consistory. And those are the four questions, so that you don't have to look them up in your church order. Are the consistory meetings held in your church? Is church discipline exercised? Are the poor and Christian schools cared for? And do you need the judgment and help of the classes for the proper government of your church? Usually it's the elder of every church that gets to answer, and you have to tip off the elder if he's there for the first time. You say yes, 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 and then say no to the fourth. Although a yes answer would indicate that there's some business that the consistory wants the classes to address. Maybe it was on the agenda. Yes, we want you to examine this man to be our minister. Um, yes, we want you to examine our minister uh, or deal with the charge of sin against our minister. But often other questions get asked. And there are also interesting questions. Sometimes class's answer is, bring a concrete case. Don't just ask a theory. It might be a theoretical question, not that it's totally irrelevant to reform church government, but it, it, you don't have a situation you're dealing with. Then we're not going to waste our time. But other times, classes gave answer uh, to such questions. May one make confession of faith without the customary period of approbation? There is no rule, I don't believe, and that was the answer of classes as well. We don't have a rule about how long a period of approbation must be. It might appear in your bulletins two weeks. Every, every consistory can make its own decision how long uh, the co congregation is informed that so-and-so made confession of faith before the consistory. He will make it publicly on such and such a day. Here, though, the issue driving it is servicemen on furlough for a brief time from the war. May they make confession of faith before the consistory, and can the consistory speed up their public confession in order that these men can get back into the service? And the answer of classes in this instance is, we don't have a rule, so use your sanctified wisdom. How far must discipline in the CRC be recognized? Again, you, 
you, the point is, these are principles that even churches today deal with. So-and-so comes from another denomination. He or she's been under discipline in the other denomination. Do we recognize that? And the answer is, and this becomes the answer of classes in this instance too, you'd better investigate the matter pretty carefully. It's not just, well, it was the CRC, so no, we're not going to worry about it. What were the charges? Today also then, if a person can say, I've been excommunicated from such a church, but the charges were groundless, it may be, I'm not promising, it may be that the PRC says, all right, we'll receive you. It may also be, and has happened before, that the PRC says, good, if they're groundless, you can convince the church that excommunicated you. Why don't you go do that? And then we're open to you coming our way. At any rate, the answer was, look into the matter and investigate. How to receive one who was dismissed from another congregation when walking in sin? This is somewhat like uh, the issue I brought up uh, two slides ago. It's a different case, though, in a different congregation but the same question remains. And the answer again is that that one ought to go to the congregation that he left and make amends there. Most office bearers who succeed themselves be reinstalled. You have a small congregation. It is not able to have rotation of office bearers. And so an elder's term is up and he either by a single slate is asked, uh, the, the, the consistory asks the congregation to prove him being the elder again, or he's voted in. Uh, do you need then to reinstall him? And the answer is yes. In the Reformed churches, we have term eldership. There are other denominations that have lifelong eldership. Then you're installed once and you're an elder until you resign or are put out of office or die. But yes, because we have term eldership, when a man serves a new term, he is to be reinstalled. Other notable decisions that are made. A Reverend Verhill is the first minister to die. It may have been noted in passing. He dies of a, a massive heart attack very suddenly in April of 1943. He's a minister of Edgerton, Minnesota. But his family, by and large, is in Grand Rapids. His body comes to Grand Rapids. The funeral is held in Grand Rapids. And it's held during the time that Classes East meets in April of 1943. The Classes attends the funeral of Reverend Verhill in, its, in the body and also goes in the procession to the cemetery. Here's one where I learned a little something too. Uh, when to hold Ascension Day services? Well, why not an Ascension Day? That's a great idea, isn't it? May we hold Ascension Day services on the Sunday after Ascension Day? That was asked in 1946 and then later in 57. And I had to say, now why would the question come up? Well, does anyone know what day Memorial Day or Decoration Day was before the 19, I think, 70s even? It was always on May 30, regardless of the day of the week. And therefore, there were years when Ascension Day fell on May 30, which was a public holiday. And in that situation, the classes said, hold the Ascension Day service on the Sunday following. So those were interesting tidbits. And then um, increase of censures, not always granted. You read, of course, in the minutes of classes, this consistory, that consistory just asked permission to erase this member or to increase censure on that member. And when I say not always granted, I just do that again to underscore that there's evidence in the minutes that the classes then, and I believe they do today also, took this seriously. They ask questions of the church and the consistory that's asking for increase of censure or permission, approval to erase. And sometimes in asking the questions, they get answers that don't satisfy the classes. At least once, a consistory was told, you never made a formal announcement that the member was under discipline. So no, we're not going to let you increase censure. That is, name the name. Um, and there were other instances, too, where the consistories were told, no, not yet. Again, in my own uh, time at uh, classes in my ministry, there have been times, there's not the majority, but there have been times when a consistory has been told, no, not yet. 
And I think that ought to encourage us. Um, that we, on the one hand, take the work of Christian discipline very seriously and want to keep the table of the Lord and the congregation of Christ pure of those who walk impenitently in sin. And yet there are checks and balances and safeguards which we observe. Uh, Protestants must provide the consistory with a complete copy of their protest. That was uh, faced already in the 1940s at the classical level. In times when classes said, we're not going to treat your protest, Mr. So-and-so, because you did not give the consistory whose decision you're protesting a copy, and therefore it doesn't have the ability to come to us with a reasonable and thought-out answer. And so today... Uh, anyone who submits a protest to a classes must have the protest to the stated clerk a month before the classes meets to meet the deadline, but also has to give that to the consistory involved so that it also has time to write a response. Add a question to the church visitation form. Um, in the green church order book, the loose leaf one that gets reprinted every five years, are the questions for church visiting. And a a church in Classes West asked in 1941 that the classes forward to synod in overture to add a question, and that overture was uh, acceded to. And the question is asked, is family visitation conducted faithfully so that each family receives an official visit once a year? Again, an indication that some of these, we could call them traditions of the Reformed churches, family visitation, for instance, and something that is prescribed in the church order that it should happen on a regular basis, uh, a a safeguard so that the consistories have to face the question, have we been doing that? And then uh, there are times when Christian school issues came to the classes. Now, this would really happen later on in the 60s, and we're not in the 60s yet. But, for instance, the the Board of Trustees of Dork College came to Classes West at one of its meetings in the 1940s, asking the classes to approve collections being taken in the classes, in the churches of the classes. It's probably how it goes in uh, the Christian Reformed Church, especially because Dort would be a denominational ministry, But our classes West said that is not our business to decide who takes collections and for what causes. You may write every congregation, every consistory, but we're not going to get into that. Okay, one major decision, and these will come up again in the future. There will be times where there's one major decision to focus on. And here it's a decision regarding admitting guests to the Lord's Supper. Let's see, I have a few handouts, and uh, this is one of them, but let me look at all those previous and just introduce them. I found a list of past conventions from a Beaconites in 2009, so we threw that in there. And then the next, I forgot to number these pages, so really pages 3 through 6 are a photocopy of the first yearbook published in 1947, and they're just for, I think, historical interest. In night, on page 7, unnumbered, you have an article in the Standard Bear by Prof. Huxima about close communion. Now, this is written uh, several decades after the 40s, but in the 40s, this decision was published. It was meant to be published, and uh, Rev. Prof. Huxima refers to it again. Mr. Editor, would you please explain in the standard bear why we speak of close rather than of closed communion in the Protestant Reformed churches? Open communion, anyone may come, provided they believe that they are saved by the blood of Christ. Closed communion, only members of this congregation may partake. If you're not a member, don't bother asking. And close, supervised, so that in some instances, visitors may partake. Of course, we often have it where visitors from other Protestant Reformed churches partake. And when I was in the ministry and would have such come, 
uh, to request permission. I only put one question to them. They've made confession of faith of the PRC. They're members in good standing. So the one question was, if you were in your church today and your church was having Lord's Supper today, is, there, is it the case that your consistory has told you you may not partake? And, of course, I've got to rely on their honesty. And if they say, no, there's no such reason, then they, uh, it's the consistory's decision, and any elder may ask any further question they want. But that's the only question that mattered to me. Now, what about when you have members from other denominations? And that happened in Holland in the 1940s. There was a protest of the decision of Holland to permit that person to come to the table of the Lord. And in response to that, the classes dealt with the matter and decided, first of all, that there are circumstances in which people may come to the Lord's table when they are not members of the PRC. I'm not going to read this at length, but on page 7, the second column, uh, under halfway down under the heavy line, as to the general question concerning the principle involved in the case of Holland. Your committee is of the opinion that members of other churches, not in all respects agreeing with our Protestant Reformed faith, may be admitted to our communion table upon their request. And then there are some stipulations that must be met under point A, and the grounds are given under point B, and recommendation point C on the uh, back page, of course, that classes adopt the above as a general declaration of the principles involved in the matter, and classes did that. Then the classes went on to say, and this is the committee's advice, but the uh, classes adopts it, that in the action of Holland's consistory, it did not in all respects agree with the above declaration of principles. And so, Holland, you were wrong. Now, the argument of the brother is you were wrong because that person wasn't PR. That's not the reason we say you're wrong. You were wrong because you didn't adhere to these wise principles. A notable decision and one that's reflected in many of the policies of Protestant Reformed congregations, consistories today, regarding when visitors will be admitted to the table of the Lord. All right, a few things in reading the minutes that just give you a sense of the flavor of the day. Uh, although it's the 1940s, and already in one of the field day brochures that I referred to maybe two weeks ago, there are many advertisements of different companies, including, I saw, an advertisement for an insurance company. So our people are, some of them, using fire insurance, etc., at the same time, there's a mentality still very strong among some that insurance companies are worldly. You're not trusting God. And one of the congregations uh, makes a decision not to have insurance on its property and building because of the worldliness of insurance companies. Well, that just gives you, again, a little glimpse into the times in which we're talking about. And then the difficulty of travel. Uh, you see from uh, the, the classes and the synod started on Wednesday and delegates from far away would have to begin traveling Monday already to get somewhere by uh, Tuesday night by train. Uh, so the difficulty of travel and then that also factors as we'll see in a while into classical appointments in classes west. Classical appointments, it has not been the practice of the churches and this is evident in the minutes to supply a vacant church with a person to preach every Sunday. Maybe for many years in classes east that's happened, but it's not an assumption that a vacant church may make, depending, of course, on how many men there are to go around and how many vacancies there are. And especially in classes west, classes west often said, we will provide you one classical appointment a month. Now that classical appointment is probably a two or even for many years a three-week appointment, but that's all we'll give you, not every Sunday. Two interesting notes. One is that first Protestant Reformed church, a church that was never vacant, Huxima from 1924 to 1964, 
And then from 39 to 44, uh, R. Veldman is a second pastor there. And then later, DeWolf is called. And in 1948, C. Hanko is called. So there's three pastors. But a church that is never vacant is given classical appointments. After Veldman took the call to Southeast, uh, fourth at the time, in the recognition that the work of a congregation that size and preaching of four sermons on a Sunday was too much for Hoxima. So it isn't that Hoxima's off the pulpit, but they get classical appointments to assist in supplying their services. And then Reverend Lubbers was ill in the late 1940s, and Randolph, therefore, asked for classical appointments. So the point I'm making is, again, you don't have to be vacant, but there needs to be a reason why, for an extended period of time, you need help supplying your pulpit. Such a church may ask for classical appointments. Here I felt very bad for Randolph. Classus did grant the request, so I didn't feel bad for them in that respect. Classus then said, Randolph, of course you're going to pay the mileage, and Randolph do this. The churches in the West always know that when a person comes from Grand Rapids or Chicago to go preach there, their travel expenses get reimbursed. Uh, but, Randolph, you're in classes east, so when the minister of second PRC goes all the way out there, or maybe shall we say the minister of South Holland goes up to Randolph to preach for you, and then someone from Grand Rapids has to go down to South Holland to preach for them, Randolph, you have to pay that guy's travel expenses too. And poor Little Randolph probably said, oh, I well, wonder how bad we need these. But anyway, that's reading a little into it. Uh, the point is, classical appointments are permitted even in cases in which churches aren't vacant. Reading sermons, I think this is the last thing to say in my survey of the classes. There are reading sermons in the classes west. In both classes, there were committees appointed to provide and, and compile sermons that churches can use to read when they don't have a minister. And in classes west, I, I won't say that ministers were very faithful, but in classes east, they even less were. In classes east, usually was asking classes west, hey, could we, could we work together with your committee? And what that generally meant was, hey, let us know if we can have some sermons, please. At any rate... There's extensive history in classes west in, in the reading sermon committee. And then books of publications. I was going to take some and put them on the back. I only have the For Zion's Feasts. I forgot the Besides Still Waters are at seminary right now. Uh, and I forgot to take them along. But books of sermons published so that a church could get the entire book. And in that book is eight to ten sermons. And once you're through with the book, then the next book needs to be published uh, it's classes east, sorry, classes west that publishes three volumes at least of Besides Still Waters. And classes east publishes a book called For Zion's Feasts. That specifically had one sermon, reading sermon, for every church holiday. So that if you were vacant over Old Year's, New Year's, Christmas, whatever, you had a reading sermon that would be appropriate for the day. So I have pictures of them. Uh, besides Still Waters, Volume 1, and Volume 2, Volume 1 has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 sermons in it. Volume 2 has four English sermons, three, three English sermons, and then this is also Volume 2, which had five Dutch sermons, and then Volume 3, uh, representatives of a, a sermon by different ministers. You don't have it all by one minister. And here you have sermons for special occasions for Zion's Feast. Uh, the New Year's Day sermon by Reverend Young, a prayer that God may teach us his way. A prayer's proper approach by Vandenberg, the admonition to be followers of God, a preparatory sermon. Gethsemane, Good Friday sermon. Mary and the risen Lord for Easter, the Son of Man exalted to glory for Ascension Day. Another paraclete promised. Pentecost. Rejoicing always for Thanksgiving, the shepherd's visit to Bethlehem for Christmas, and expecting the new for an old year's day. Okay, one thing I've forgotten to do, and been reminded that I forgot to do, is stop and allow time for questions. So I'm to the point where we're going to look at 
uh, how things are trending toward 1953, and it's an appropriate time for questions up to this point, if any of you have any. All right, I'll continue then. What's going on in the 40s? Now, there's more going to happen in 50, 51, 52, of course, with a view to what happens in 53, and I'm limiting it to the 40s. What's happening in the 40s with a view to 1953? Well, there are four things. And the first is the visit of Klaus Skilder now in 1947. He'd come in 1939. Two men sponsored him, one from New Jersey and Mr. Erdman's from Grand Rapids. Uh, he had expected to be able to preach in CRCs. They pretty well closed their pulpits to him. And so the PRC said, well, we'll listen to you and, and fellowship with you. And in 1947, now the war, after 39, he's gone back. Uh, he's been in hiding. In 1944, he and his churches, he was deposed from the GKN, and his denomination, the Liberated, began. So a lot has happened. And the effects of the war, well, the effects still go on, but the war is over. So there's talk again about Skilder. And in 1947, the PRC invites him to come and permits him to preach in our pulpits. This is a synodical decision. And I highlight permits to preach because it is the only time of which I am aware in the history of the PRC that no, nope, not quite the only. It is still a momentous time in that a non-PR man is permitted to preach the PRC. Now, of course, we allow sister churches, ministers to do that. But I think back perhaps before there was a sister church in Northern Ireland, it's possible that a Reverend Hutton did the same. At any rate, this does not happen quickly. Now, Though Synod allowed that, Huxima knew that the covenant view of Skilder and the covenant view of the PRC were different views. Huxima also knew that Skilder and Huxima did not agree on the matter of common grace. To be clear on that, Skilder did not agree with the CRC's presentation of common grace, nor did Huxima. They have that in common. But they also did not agree on how to fix the matter, how rightly to present the matter. So Huxima knows that there are these differences, but he expects and trusts that the ministers will be able to understand those differences and won't be swayed by them. You can read more, uh, perhaps, in Gertrude Huxima's book, a watered garden, but also in C. Hanko's Less Than the Least. So, uh, Reverend Skilder, Dr. Skilder, does expense, extensive speaking, has an extensive speaking itinerary. I put it in uh, the handout on page 9, just so you have an idea of how busy he's kept. He goes through the churches in the West, lecturing and preaching, lecturing in every one practically, preaching in a good number of them, sometimes even on a Thursday night or midweek night. But he goes through, and, and this takes the better part of two months to make this part of the tour. In addition, he's in the East for another time. Uh, when the Christian Forum Church hears he's coming, it again warns its members against him. And in the places he goes, especially in the West, the audience is very small. Now, the PR churches are very small, but he goes to northwest Iowa. He goes to southern California. There are many Reformed believers in these areas, and many in other denominations might say, let's go hear him. But apparently the CRC's warning has had its effect. Uh, another photograph of the itinerary, this time without all of the what train he's coming on and what time he'll be there and who's going to pick him up. Just a reminder of... Uh, where he'll be and when. So he goes throughout the churches. And with a view to 53, there's a two, two distinct reactions to Skilder. 
The first reaction is that of Andrew Kaminga in the Concordia. Andrew Kaminga is the editor of the Concordia since Voss left for uh, Hudsonville. And Andrew Kaminga says that to give an evaluation this time of Prof. Skilder's conception of the covenant and the significance of the sacrament of baptism is not only impossible, but also irresponsible. We should study the matter more carefully. Well, okay, maybe, but don't kid yourself, and Kaminga was not. He, he understood very well. These are exactly the points at issue. His conception of the covenant and the significance of the covenant in relation to baptism. So, Read it charitably, and you could say, sure, Kaminga, we should study that more carefully. We don't just spout off. Read it less charitably, and you say, hold on. Uh, this is the pressing issue of the day. Don't put this off too long. But then Kaminga goes on to say, the brother cannot honestly be placed in the category of the Heinzian conception. The charge, too, that Prof. Skilder's conceptions of these matters have an Arminian coloring should also be abolished. All right? Even in a minute, another man, a sounder man, is going to admit that he, that is, Skilder and Heinz's views are not identical. There are distinctions to be made. Is that all that Kaminga's doing? Probably not. What he's trying to do here uh, is say that we don't have to fault the brother for his covenant view. And if you call him Arminian, you're really overstating it. So I'm going to interpret Kaminga's statements, which could be interpreted more gently perhaps, still to be saying, and in light of the whole history that, uh, that followed, I think I'm right on, uh, we don't need to worry about Skilder and his covenant view. That's one response by Andrew Kaminga in the Concordia. But then in the East... Uh, the ministers have a conference on October 16 with Skilder, and when that conference doesn't address everything they want to, they come back in November 4 and 5 for another one. And now it's Reverend George Lubbers, again in the Concordia. Um, as I skimmed through a number of Concordias this morning, more than once, on more than one topic, I saw Reverend Lubbers writing an article that we could all appreciate, and he was doing it in really a magazine that's open to any Protestant Reformed person, but what really was going on in these, this and another article regarding the seminary, is that he's presenting a different view from what the editors of the Concordia were wanting to present. So Reverend Lovers admits that the PRC and the Liberated have a very different covenant conception. In fact, that's a, almost a quote from Huxma himself. Huxma says the PRC and the Liberated have a very different covenant conception. Klaus Skilder said, it isn't as different as you think. And then Lubbers says, it became evident that although uh, his view is not that of the late Professor Hines, okay, again, from a technical viewpoint, it isn't just that they're one and the same, the difference hardly seems to be one merely of a difference of terminology. In other words, there's still something going on here. It's maybe not Heinzian completely. When I think of the distinction he's making, I think back to the many times in which our canons of Dort calls Arminianism Pelagianism. And a person could say it's not Pelagianism. Pelagian and, and Arminius had a very different uh, beliefs. There, there were significant differences in their theology. You'd have to grant the point if you're going to spell out their, their system and its details. But isn't there a common thread? And isn't the common thread that both give man some work, some thing he has to do? So we don't hesitate from saying that Arminianism is Pelagian, not because it is an exact duplicate but because at its very core, it shares a fundamental view. And that's really what Lovers is doing here. Yes, Heinz and Skilder have distinctions in their covenant views, but we know we disagree with Heinz. We'd better look more carefully at Skilder's because 
in a nut, in a nutshell, or at bottom, they aren't as different as you think. All right, that's going on. After that little exchange that already tips your hand to the fact that there are two very different viewpoints on Skilder and his covenant view, uh, Concordia, uh, A. Petter, Andrew Petter, begins writing a series on the covenant. And there are over 48, so 50 or more installments on the covenant. And he thoroughly evaluates those aspects of the doctrine of the covenant that are at issue in the PRC and with Skilder. And he sides with Skilder, or if not sides completely, he certainly uh, is not defending the PRC view well. Uh, later on, he writes about faith as a condition, and in the 1950s, his, uh, his tune will be uh, the brief Declaration of Principles. He'll examine that. In other words, more than any other man in the Concordia, not the only man doing it, but more than any other, Petter is pushing the limits. And therefore, he's the one who, more than any other, gets response in the standard bearer. Uh, Hoeksema had a stroke. Uh, Voss is the editor in replacement until Hoeksema is better. And in January 15, he starts editorials on the subject of the covenant defending the PRC view. And a month before that, under the rubric Our Doctrine, H. Veldman had begun doing it. And both of these are series that go on for a while. In volume 25, Hooksma's back, and he writes on covenant, uh, about the covenant. He also has a series of editorials on baptism. He has open letters to Skilder. And then H.H., Veldman, and Alpoff both have editorial, uh, editorials and articles regarding Petters and Kaminga's articles in the Standard and the uh, Concordia. Continuing in volume 25, Alpoff has some very worthwhile articles, The Fathers Regarding Conditions. Yes, Reformed men use the word condition in reference to faith or, uh, especially faith, in the covenant. But their point was not that faith was man's part, that God said, here, I'll do all this, but it's up to you to believe. When they use the word condition, it didn't imply that God left something up to man, which man must do for the covenant to be in effect. But when the fathers used condition, they meant the necessary way, or in Latin, the sine qua non, the without which it isn't. If you don't have faith, there is no covenant. And in speaking that way, they weren't denying in fact, they very clearly recognized faith as a gift of God. So Alpoff writes that article to demonstrate, because the, 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 the argument is, well, the Reformed theologians have always spoken of faith as a condition. And uh, Alpoff says, but they meant something very different. Then he turns to Deuteronomy, the if sentences in Deuteronomy, and demonstrates from them also that the point of the word of God is not that God really says, I'll do this. If you do that, and if you do that, then I will bless you. But the if sentences, remember, they're spoken to Israel, the covenant people of God. They underscore the particular character of the covenant. They also underscore that being in the covenant and enjoying the covenant blessings and living a holy life uh, of thankful obedience are all go together. You can't have some without the other. That's Article 20 or Volume 25. Article, volume 26, HH is writing as to conditions up off on and covenant breaking. And there's more going on. Uh, it's, I've given you a taste of it. If you got the Concordia and the Standard Bearer, the Concordia every two weeks and the Standard Bearer twice a month. If you got them both at your home, and if you were the sort to want to keep up with the latest, you were kept very busy reading what was going on uh, regarding the covenant matter. So an analysis. It struck me that 
in the early years after 1924, the standard bearer had much to say about common grace, but also much to say not about common grace. In other words, it strove to say, yes, when it comes to our doctrinal departments, we're going to deal with the issue, but there's more than just doctrine going on the standard bearer. There's meditations, there's uh, Bible studies, there's, there's other features and rubrics. But when it came to this era, it seemed to me that the polemics against the Petter's view and Kaminga's views were all the stronger. And that would make sense to me uh, because the issue and the, the battle, as it were, is within the PRC now. It's not PRC versus CRC. It's within the PRC, and our existence is at stake. Uh, another thing, how does an oyster make a pearl? Well, a pearl is made by an oyster when some sand gets under its shell. The sand irritates the oyster's soft flesh, and the oyster secretes uh, a secretion that hardens and forms a buffer around that. In other words, it takes an irritation to make something beautiful, and that's true of doctrinal development here too. Development of doctrine requires controversy. Uh, the, the controversy wasn't enjoyable, it wasn't fun, but God's purpose in and through it is that the PRC more clearly understand the doctrine of the covenant. The first thing, Harbinger of 1953, was Skilder's visit and the effects and such in the Concordia and in the Standard Bearer. Number two, in 1949, de Young and Koch visit the Netherlands. They make a personal, unofficial visit. And I wanted to, but didn't get a chance to read in extreme detail and at length their own report of it, which you can find in the Concordia beginning in April 1950 and in subsequent issues. The first three I read, and uh, he was still at sea. In other words, by the third, uh, the first one he had, was making his plans, he left his house. And the second one he was on the train getting to the coast. And the third one he sailed out of, out of uh, New York. And so um, I didn't have time to get all the way to the Netherlands and see how his trip went. Nonetheless, they went there. While they were in the Netherlands, they met with members of Skilder's group and encouraged them and others who were immigrating to join the PRC and said, we don't, after all, have an official covenant view. You might not agree with Reverend Hooksema's covenant view, but that's Reverend Hooksema's covenant view. So because the PRC does not have an official covenant view, don't let that scare you. You may join the PRC. And that is the reason why an immigrant in Canada writes a letter to Professor Howarda and gets a letter back from Professor Howarda, which Reverend Opoff publishes in the Standard Bear, and I have in the handout, and I'm going to look now at the translation of the missive, page 470 on the top left-hand corner. I'll read the first paragraph a moment. I received your letter yesterday and a direct reply per airmail is in order. Day before yesterday, we held a meeting with Reverend Cock and Reverend DeYoung, the purpose being mutual discourse. We had a wholly open-hearted exchange of thoughts. They said this, Indeed, we have much to be grateful for to Reverend Hooksema, but his conception regarding election, etc., is not church doctrine. No one is bound by it. Some are emitting a totally different sound. Their opinion was that most of the Protestant reform do not think as Reverend Hooksma and Reverend Opoff. And sympathy for the liberated was great also in the matter of their doctrine of the covenant. They do accentuate differently in America. Uh, Howarda is saying, yeah, the, the, the Americans would say it differently and put emphases on things differently uh, considering their history. But for the conception of the liberated, there is ample room. All right. He goes on to say in the next paragraph, towards the middle of it or so, that the Protestant Reformed Church is the true church, be it that the lay 
uh, conception regarding election is somewhat different. The true church, the liberated, viewed every city as having one true church. You had to find that one. It wasn't a matter of a spectrum. In fact, we wouldn't even say true and false is a spectrum. There is a demarcation line. But true churches are more or less pure, or the gospel is more or less purely preached, and that's where the spectrum lies. Uh, the, the CRC, I'm sorry, the Liberated, and that was found in the Canadian Reformed yet, said there's one true church. And so when he says the Protestant Reformed Church is the true church, he's doing more than saying it's a true church. He's saying it's really the place you almost have to be. All right, and then two more sentences. The first is about, oh, seven lines from the bottom of the first column. Our liberated would be doing a fruitful work if they labored in the Protestant Reformed churches to remove misunderstanding and to deepen insight, Reverend Cox said. And then the last three lines of the quote on the second column. Now I believe, however, that accession is calling. It's our calling to join them. And then so that the liberated also help to disseminate the dogmatical wealth of Holland and the Protestant Reformed churches. So based on what de Koch and uh, what Koch and de Young say, the advice to a man in Canada who wonders whether he should join the PRC is yes. The liberated who immigrate to the, the New World should join the PRC. And instead of learning the PRC's view of the covenant, they should be ready to share their insights. That letter arrives in a man's mailbox in Canada one day, and that weekend, Reverend Opoff is preaching uh, in, whether it was Hamilton or Chatham, and the man shows Reverend Opoff that letter, and Reverend Opoff says, when I smell a fish, I know it's a fish, and this is a fish, and he publishes the letter. He gets heat for publishing the letter. Should you have done that? Should you have done that before talking to uh, Cock and uh, De Young, and later he admits, no, I probably should have waited a little. But he needed to expose that uh, PR ministers have been saying things that he did not think were right. And I won't read the rest of the uh, article. It is an informative article with Alpoff's assessment of it. This is point number two in how things are heating up uh, with a view to 1953. All right, I got through the first point there. And De Young and Cock and other ministers are going to defend themselves. They go on the defensive. So again, you have another issue where PRC ministers are on different sides. And then there's the mission work in Ontario, Canada. Uh, Post-World War II immigration. We already saw last time that the two missionaries uh, appointed in 1947 were to labor together. But one got sent to Linden, and one got sent to uh, Hamilton and Chatham. And Alpoff protests that. And among the points of his protest were that the immigrants coming from the liberated have a double-track theology. And the Synod, which upheld his protest about where uh, the ministry should labor, said, but there's part of your protests that we're not going to assume any responsibility for, and this was part of it. Nevertheless, the man is insightful, and he knows what's going on there. And so that's point number three. The fourth thing, Harbingers of 1953, is a general dissatisfaction found in the, in the denomination. I find this in different sources. A Homer Hooksima in an archived source that's not publicly available uh, Hooksima himself would say it. Uh, Hanko, in less than the least, says it. The ministers wanted to grow. Uh, they wanted to grow as a denomination, and then many of them were in the West in small churches, and they wanted to grow or be more prominent. So there's some discontentment in that sense. And even in the people, there's opposition to Protestant formed education. They say that the preaching is too doctrinal, too sharp, and too strict. There is, in general... 
uh, thinking that maybe it was fine for my grand, or for my father 20 years ago to come into the PRC, but I'm not so happy with where the PRC is at. And in that way, in the late 40s, you can see 1953 is coming. These are the war years, and the war, World War II is over now, but in the PRC, there are still battles. So that brings me to the end and some concluding reflections on the last five, six nights together and the history of the first 25 years. The first place we've covered the PRC from infancy to maturity. When we say maturity, I don't mean that it attained a point at which it, it, that the goal was reached. The goal of the church on earth is always to continue to grow. And finally, in heaven, we will be fully mature. But she was born out of controversy in her infancy. And though there were pleasant years in the 30s, not financially, but as regards the denomination's existence, uh, she would have to face controversy in the late 40s and early 50s. And the Lord prepares her for that, and part of her coming to maturity is is preparing her to face the controversy. And uh, so the all that she goes through prepares her to wage the battle. And now I'm going to quote something or refer to something that I'm quite sure Prof. Dykstra himself said, and he may have got it from somebody else. The, the, the conditional covenant, unconditional covenant controversy, as the PRC faced it in 1953, is a kind of controversy that you could not have in just any church. It had to be a church committed to the doctrines of sovereign, particular grace. And then working to see how that affected and what implications that had for the doctrine of the covenant. All right, there's doctrinal development in the PRCA in these years. Then the doctrine of sovereign particular grace is developed in our thought anyway. We don't have confessional statements that we created that represented it. But in our thought, there's growth in writing and in preaching. And the doctrine of God's unilateral gracious covenant of friendship is going to be developed. When you know there is doctrinal development happening, positive doctrinal development, that's based on the Reformed creeds, you know you're in a true church. I don't mean that that was a mark. There are three marks of the true church, and doctrinal development is not specifically one of them. But where you know and can see doctrinal development that proceeds from the foundation of the Reformed Creed, you know you're in a true church. And that's why I want to emphasize this also, that the PRC, in the years in which we are speaking of them, were true churches. And I have no issue saying they still are. Of course, if I thought they weren't, I shouldn't be here. But they were. And more and more, as the RPs look at the PRC and keep going farther back in our history to try to uncover cracks or flaws and wrong teachings farther back, they're trying to attack this point. You don't have doctrinal development, positive doctrinal development, based on the creeds if you're in a false church. Uh, but we'll certainly grant that churches today are imperfect. Every church of Christ throughout the world at every time has been imperfect, and the PRC in its first 25 years also was imperfect. We're not defending the forefathers as if they could make and did make no mistakes. The salvation of a church, though, a group of people has all the characteristics of the salvation of individual people. It's gracious, undeserved, unmerited, merciful. In other words, if the PRC were perfect, it wouldn't need to be saved. We wouldn't need Christ to live and dwell among us. We're imperfect. That humbles us, all the more it also makes us say, then we need a sovereign Savior. So knowing the history of the PRC to this point works in us 
First of all, gratitude, thanks to God for all he's done in and through us. Secondly, humility, let us not boast in what men have done, but recognize that it's in spite of our sins and weaknesses that God uses us, and hope and expectation for the future. If God uh, raised us up and preserved us in those years, then he will preserve us so long as he sees fit, and we pray until our Lord returns in truth and in godliness, and in exhibiting the marks of the true church, then let us strive yet to be faithful to him. And that's what I pray it motivates us to do, a prayer for faithfulness to the end, and faithfulness in doctrine, in worship, in church government, in service, in personal lives, faithfulness in every respect. The knowledge of our history must make us say, I want to be like the fathers were. Well, we won't be like the fathers were in that we'll fight the same battles of the same context. We live in a different day and age. But may we be like them in that we exhibit the same spiritual gifts and graces. With that, I thank you for your attention. My plan uh, for next summer was to see if Prof. Dykstra would do his 1953 but I make no promises as to whether that will happen. He, he, he initially was interested. Uh, you look for bulletin announcements. But if not next year, then I would pray and hope that the following summer I will be continuing this series. Any questions any of you have? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have much, and we mean that spiritually now, though we have much physically and materially as well. And although we have much spiritually, it's all a gift from Thee, and even when we acknowledge that the doctrinal development that our churches have experienced it happened because men committed themselves to the defense of the truth and the searching of the scriptures and were busy in that. When we acknowledge the role men played, we still understand they were means, means of thine to give us growth and development and deeper understanding. And so we're thankful to Thee. Our churches continue to face troubles because Satan hates the church. And our prayer is that we might be faithful to Thee and continually equipped to fight the battles we must fight and to be faithful in preaching in administration of the sacraments, in doing church discipline, faithful to Thee all of our life long. Our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, may they too, and all who continue to represent the Protestant Reformed Churches of America. And now with humble gratitude to Thee, and acknowledging that it's all of grace, we pray that thou wilt give us more grace. Grace to hope in thee, trust in thee. Grace to continue to live as the church of Christ and as Christians ought to live. Grace that magnifies Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives and dwells among us. Forgive then our sins. Dismiss us with thy blessing and hear us for Christ's sake. Amen.